We love it. All right, and then recording started. If you're watching this uh, in, in the future, welcome. <laughs> uh, thank you for, for joining us. Um, all right, before we get started, I wanna say we will uh, have a little time towards the end of the hour where if you have questions for John, you'd like to ask. I know some folks submitted a few ahead of time, some of which are fantastic specifically for the, for the burritos. Um, so I'll, I'll try to get through those, but if you have additional questions, uh, if you go to the chat function in Zoom, you will be able to send myself a uh, Rudy DPL, a private message. Uh, send, send me a chat question there um, just so uh, I can look at it and uh, prepare, uh, prepare myself to, uh, to read it out loud. So if you have questions, please send them there. Um, if not, uh, you can always you know, throw some, some cheers and, and happy well wishes out into the, the general chat of the chat function as well. And so without any further ado, John Scalzi, thank you so much for joining us. How, how are you on this Saturday? Uh, you know, I'm pretty good. I am, uh, as I mentioned, I'm actually, I'm actually on vacation at the moment. My uh, wife and, uh, and I decided to do a uh, little romantic getaway, but I had scheduled this. So I was like, I was like, we can be totally romantic, but at, <laughs> you know, at this particular time, I have to do this thing. So uh, she's out at the pool right now. And, uh, and I'm here answering your questions and stuff like that. So, but uh, yeah, no, everything's, everything's really good. Wonderful. Well, we're so, so happy to have you here with us and uh, we won't keep you too, too long um, mm -hmm. from the romantic getaway. I know that's very <laughs> Um, yeah, so the first thing I always like to ask authors is, um, what are you, what are you reading right now? What are you enjoying? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I have two books here that I actually have physically with me, uh, that I took with me on vacation to actually show you. The first is The Grief of Stones, which is by Catherine awesome. Addison. Now, this takes place in the universe of the Goblin Emperor. Uh, which is one of my favorite uh, books of basically the last decade or so. Um, and it's best to say it's sort of like a, um, it's like murder she wrote in this particular universe. And it has a, a main character who actually uh, is able to speak with the recently deceased to find out, you know, if they've been murdered, what's going on with them. Um, and so there's a mystery in it and things are going on, on there. I don't want to spoil it too much for anyone. It's the second book in the uh, series featuring this particular character uh, and the third book in the, the Goblin Emperor uh, series. I absolutely recommend everybody read Goblin Emperor. Like I said, it's tremendous, nominated for uh, Hugo, um, but all of the books are just spectacular. Uh, the second book I'm reading is a uh, book that's upcoming. It's nonfiction. It'll be out actually I think next week or the week after that. No, the August 16th. It is called All the Living and the Dead. And it's by Haley Campbell. And it's it's a great cover, right? Um, yeah. And it is basically covering all the people who uh, deal with um, the dead. You know, so uh, detectives, uh, uh, coroners, uh, the people who work at the, at the mortuary, uh, private investigators, uh, basically just covering the whole uh, angle of that. And it's fascinating and it's extremely well written uh, and it's lovely. Um, and those are the two books that I'm reading right now. That's so fun. Yeah. I, uh, I, I was in my head, I was thinking that, because uh, I've interviewed a few authors now and almost without fail, they're always reading nonfiction, which sure. I, yeah, and so I was like, I wonder if, if, if John will just have nothing but nonfiction for us as well. The, the, the thing about nonfiction is usually when I'm writing a novel, I'm not reading fiction because somebody else's, the way sure. that they do fiction will just leak into my fingers and then it'll be a thing. Um, I'm making an exception for the Catherine Addison book just because I'm such a huge fan, I didn't want to wait. Um, but uh, so yeah, when I'm writing fiction, I read, I read nonfiction a lot. But the other thing is I also write nonfiction. I started as a journalist. <laughs> You know, I have a number of nonfiction books, um, so I don't feel like, you know, it's sort of like I'm cheating on fiction to read nonfiction. It's just it's more yeah. of this is the other side of what I do um, as a writer. I'm well, I'm better known at this point um, for being a novelist, but I had actually written, I think, like three or four uh, nonfiction books um, wow. before my before my first novel ever came out. So <laughs> when I mentioned that to people, they're like, really? 
you have this whole other side for uh, to to what you do and i'm like yeah I, you know i'm a writer we 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 have multiple we have multiple revenue streams because anything could collapse at any time yes <laughs> Um, is the is the same true vice versa when you're writing nonfiction? Are you pre predominantly reading fiction or does it not? It's not quite the same because usually, and I don't mean this as, uh, you know, uh, like an insult, but um, nonfiction is not usually, not usually um, as much style based as fiction is. Um, so I don't worry about sort of uh, like uh, voice contamination as much. Um, and then also because when you're writing uh, nonfiction, you're you're having to often read other nonfiction stuff just for reference and stuff like that. So less of a problem. But I do tend to read more fiction when I'm writing nonfiction simply because the other thing about it is when I'm done writing, when I'm writing nonfiction, I, my brain needs a break. So I'm writing, so I'm reading <laughs> fiction. When I'm writing fiction, my brain needs a break. So I'm writing. I'm reading the nonfiction. So the things that I, the thing that I'm doing, I'm reading sort of usually the opposite of that. Cool, cool. That's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so I, we are, uh, we're at this, this place. We are certainly not uh, post pandemic yet, but um, mm -hmm. you know, things are a little, a little different than they, not, maybe not as intense as they were for the past couple of years. Sure. What has, uh, what has the process of writing been like for you during the pandemic time? Did you find things were more challenging, easier for whatever reason? How was it for you? The, it's kind of interesting because 2020 was the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it was also a very sort of uh, uh, chaotic time in our sort of national moment, right? Um, and the two things came together and it really messed me up. Right. I was writing in I was writing a novel in 2020. And I, I mentioned this in the afterword of Kaiju Preservation Society, which is the book that came out in March. Um, I was writing an entirely different novel in 2020. Um, and I just couldn't finish it. Um, partly because um, the world was on fire. Um, and then at the end of the year, November and December, um, all the nose swabs told me that I didn't have COVID, uh, but uh, I just couldn't think. Like, you know, I could like, I could like answer email, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't plot and I couldn't do any of that sort of stuff. Um, and so I ended up because of the two, not being able to focus, not being, you know, uh, either because of events that were going on in the world. And then um, also just, you know, the, the physical state, I ended up completely abandoning that novel that I was trying to write all through uh, 2020. So um, definitely the pandemic, messed me up in that sort of respect. I hate to say it, if it had only, and I really put that in quotes, if it had only been the pandemic, I might've been okay. Because I, uh, you know, my day-to-day -day life when I'm not on tour uh, mm -hmm. or not taking romantic vacations with big 70s curtains um, is I'm in my house by myself writing, right? Um, so we, we started the, the pandemic coming back from one of the last cruises that was allowed to dock. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so we went immediately into quarantine from, uh, from that. Um, and literally for like the first two or three months, it was like, this is, you know, everybody else is trapped in their house. This is Tuesday for me, right? <laughs> uh, it was just completely normal for me. Eventually it sort of wore on me. Um, mm -hmm. So, but in that sort of sense, the pandemic in of itself, I don't think would have uh, messed me up as much, but it was also just added into election year and riots right. and everything else that was that was going on. Um, and it ended up just being uh, quite a lot. Now, the end of that was when I, as soon as I was like, I had to admit to my, um, you know, to my uh, editors, like, I can't finish this novel. Uh, and so, and it was on the schedule and everything else like that. And he was like, it's fine, I understand. We're not happy, but you know we understand. Uh, as soon as I did that, a whole other novel dropped into my brain, right? Literally, like from start to finish. And I finished that book, which was the Kaiju um, Preservation Society, in five weeks because it was all just there, ready to go. Um, so 
on one sense, it was a huge amount of struggle. On the other hand, sense, my brain apparently understood that I was, you know, what I was going through and had a plan B ready for me. So thank you, brain. <laughs> um, and as a result, um, I think I came out with a better novel, right? I think Kaiju was a better novel. It was a more fun novel. It was kind of a novel that, uh, you know, I wrote to have a breather. And I think when people are reading it, are they're like, this is just fun. I, I needed fun. Um, which was much more than because the previous novel was dark and gritty political thriller in space. And I was like, not, not, yeah. it would have been a slog to read at this particular point in, in, in the sure. world. I might get back to it at some point, but you know, when, when things are better and everybody's <laughs> cheerful, then I'll write my angsty yeah. novel about <laughs> claustrophobia in space. That's so fascinating to find out about. Um, yeah. I, the, the different authors I've asked this question to, it's, it's, it's fascinating to hear. Some have, have said similar things and then some have said, you know, writing was fine, but I couldn't read all, you know, over the sure. first, yeah. Yeah, you know, and then you have Brandon Sanderson, who is like, oh, I just wrote sure. four, four huge tomes <laughs> because yeah. that's what I do. Um, and it is, but it is kind of funny because it is, and I think it's absolutely accurate. Every writer dealt with 2020 and the pandemic and everything else that was attached to it um, in their in their own way, and it's the uh, I think it's good for people to recognize um, that the that writers and novelists aren't black boxes, right? We are affected by the same things you are affected by. Um, that some days it's easy to sit down and write two thousand words. Some days mm -hmm. we're lucky if we can get a hundred words out. Um, and the 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 varied responses to what writers how writers responded to the pandemic is absolutely matched by how everybody else responded to the pandemic as well. Some people were like, I'm making sourdough, life is good. And some people just, you know, uh, really couldn't handle it well. You know, it, the, the thing that, that was really interesting for me was um, all of a sudden you had uh, all these people who are like, um, now the couples, you know, the people who live together, you know, whether they're roommates or they're, you know, uh, in a long-term relationship or they're married or whatever, they are literally stuck with each other 24 <laughs> seven for months on end. And then you find out at the end of it, people are like, and we've become even closer. And the other people are like, we are done. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Um, so it's been a crucible for everybody, I think. I, I and my wife got through it just fine. You know, I'm, I'm happy to say so. Yeah, well, we're happy, happy as well. Um, so, Something that's been uh, more in the, the pop popular spectrum now these these days has been um, book banning and uh, censorship mm -hmm. and, and this and that. It's kind of it's never gone away, but it's come back into uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> right all of our yeah. awareness. Um, right. As an author, what are your thoughts on um, I guess the banning of books? And to your recollection, have have any of your books been challenged or, or banned that you know of? No, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm a straight white man writing straight white fiction, you know, um, it's going to be, uh, I am not the person and I'm writing it for adults. So I'm uh, not the person that they're, they're aiming it for, you know, and I would like to speak to not just as a, as a writer, um, but as an American citizen, you know, mm -hmm. let me, let me, you know, imagine this has changed from orange blossoms <laughs> to the American flag yeah. waving behind me as I do this. Um, book banning is absolutely antithetical to every single thing, uh, our, you know, our nation was founded on and that are, uh, you know, and that are, uh, the founding fathers believed in, because I know we have to drag the founding fathers into this. Thomas Jefferson gifted us the friggin' library of Congress, right? You know, it is in the United States DNA, along with so many other things, um, that we uh, cherish knowledge, we cherish understanding, we uh, are not afraid uh, to look at, understand, uh, and process opposing views, and so on and so forth. When people um, come forward to ban books, uh, what they are telling me is, um, they're not particularly patriotic. They're not particularly American. They're uh, they're afraid, um, or if they're not afraid, um, they're being absolutely cynical and spending time making sure other people are wasting their time 
dealing with this sort of thing. Now, book banning, just as a general sense, never never works because, uh, as Stephen King has said, you know, uh, hey kids, look for the you know, find out which books they're banning and then go read those because that is the stuff they don't want you to know. Um, and there's never been a, a a more consistent way to make a book interesting to a teenager uh, than to to try to ban it. Um, but the second thing is, by and large, particularly this tranche of book burning that we recently had has nothing to do about you know an, uh, you know somebody in their house reading a book and going oh my goodness I uh, I can't believe that this is a thing that uh, you know my child is reading what they've done is that they've gotten their uh, they've gotten their assignments uh, from someone else they're saying you need to go to your library you need to go to your school and you need to tell them I'm opposed to this book and that book and every other book. Um, and I remember there's one library uh, which I thought had a really good solution for this, which was um, the individual who comes to complain about the book. Uh -huh. They have to have read the book and they have to say specifically what it is in the book um, that they find, for example, pornographic or inappropriate. Or all this sort of stuff, and you have to understand what pornographic means or inappropriate. And the thing is, is if you make people, if you make it a thing where you're like, you have to actually have read the book in order to speak mm -hmm. knowledgeably about why you want it banned, it drops off dramatically because who knew uh, mm -hmm. that uh, the vast majority of the people who are uh, book banners aren't reading the books that they're challenging, right? Um, so it's nonsense. And I, you know, I'm not speaking about that as an author, although as an author, um, you know, I think it's nonsense. I'm speaking a bit uh, specifically as an American. I'm speaking to it as a human being who believes that knowledge and empathy and understanding are actually uh, the only way we're going to get out of this, you know, mess uh, that is the world today um with uh any sort of chance of a happy ending so to speak so um when i when i hear someone say you know i want this book man i i hear i'm afraid i'm a coward and i don't believe my own ideals can compete with the ideals that are being put together uh and put forth in this book therefore i will do everything i can that uh, to make sure those ideas are never seen in the first place. So yeah, if you want yourself to be branded an unpatriotic coward, go ahead and ban that book, kids. I'm I'm done with my soapbox now. The curtain could definitely stopped. see. Yeah, <laughs> the curtain has stopped being a, a waving American flag at this point. I, I, I saw the uh, the bald eagle I mean, fly I, past and screech right there at the end. I mean, you're not surprised by this answer, are you? I mean, I certainly hope not. I'd be like, well, as an author, I'm all for book burning because you know, <laughs> book burning because I mean, my books are the only books that will be left. If you want something, you get scaldy. No, you know, no. <laughs> Please don't ban books. Do you have any um, personal uh, memories of? your own hometown library or a library that's that's near you now, whether they be fond memories or not so fond memories? Sure. Um, I mean, uh, most of my memories of libraries are fond, except for the fact that I was always, as a child, um, in arrears for library fines. Like, literally, they're like, <laughs> you owe us $30. I'm like, I don't know where I'm going to get $30. <laughs> I can't give blood, you know? So. Um, but uh, no, I, I actually, a number of years ago, a number of years ago, there was a piece by some author in the UK who is like, ah, we don't need libraries anymore. We've got Amazon, you know, and every <laughs> once in a while that idea pops up again, um, which is, of course, obviously nonsense and, you know, uh, sort of classist nonsense that, um, but I, so I wrote a piece about every library that I'd ever, you know, uh, basically encountered in my life, right? You know, from the very first library, which was in Red Bluff, California, when I was five, and I was taken to the library by my aunt, and she put me in the kids section, and she was like, any book, you can check it out and take it home. And I'm like, what? This is the most amazing thing. Whoever thought this was a, a, a 
whoever knew you could do this? It was like literally my brain exploded in the, in the children's department of the uh, Red Bluff Public Library. And then, you know, later on when I was at the Glendora Public Library, my mother was a single working mother. Um, and so after school, I went to the library. You know, that was, you know, how I got through the hours between being out of school and my mother coming home, right? And, you know, uh, and then later on, you know, in college, going to the University of Chicago, where they've got, you know, some of the biggest libraries in the world uh, there and, uh, you know, staying there. The library that uh, I went to the very first time I got a book sold and I had to do research. And this was when the internet was still, they had barely figured out Google. Um, so, you know, I went to the library and I checked out all the books that were on that particular topic. Um, and then later on, um, going to the library at the little li uh, at the little town that I live in now, Bradford, um, and, you know, giving them, you know, uh, the books that I had written be like, here, these are, these are for you. Um, and I, you know, uh, all my memories of, of libraries are, are, you know, pretty vivid because they're, they're important to me. But the other thing is the recognition that at each step of the way, they sort of, um, the, what I've been getting out of the library talks to the depth and breadth of the services that they offer to, you know, the community. It's not just about, you know, um, one thing or another thing. For the kids, it's the, you know, it's the fact that you can check out your very first picture books or that there is, there are reading contests and stuff like that. Um, for the adults, it's not just that you can get the latest, you know, thriller or whatever, but they have the computers and they have the services and they have the staff um, that can actually help, help you navigate that sort of stuff. And they do have programs uh, that they that they do that are not just about books, but they are about you know serving the community and having that hole in the community. I remember back in 2012 or something like that, um, Ohio or no 2008, Ohio had you know basically a hole in its um, you know uh, budget because uh, it was 2008. This is the global recession. Um, and they were, and they were basically, you know, coming down for the, you know, coming for the libraries and they were just going to cut them down. And one of the things I did was I just, you know, I was like, I, here's the book that's coming out. I'm going to auction this thing, you know, and if, you know, um, you know, and all the money's going to the library and that was, and somebody came along and was like $10,000 and I showed up at the library. I was like, I I'm going to donate to you and <laughs> wrote the the ten thousand dollar check, um, but that was a sort of like that was payment for services rendered for every single library that I had, uh, you know, it, that I had ever used up to that particular point. So um, yeah, good memories of libraries, and uh, hoping to have more memories of libraries from here. I mean, I think they are um, is one of the single most important. Uh, things we do as communities um, in, you know, and I'm not just saying that because Dallas Public Library, I'm doing yeah. an event for Dallas Public Library. I, you could ask me this on the street and I'd be mm -hmm. like one, random question for to be asked <laughs> on the street, but two, here I go. Uh, and I would say basically the same thing. If, the, if, you, want, if you want a, you know, canary in a coal mine um, symbol for the health of a nation, check how their libraries are doing. It's as simple as that. We uh, <laughs> really appreciate it. And now's a great I time. Don't, I don't know if you knew that that <laughs> you could just wind me up and I would go for, for minutes at a time, but this is a thing I do, so. Fantastic. <laughs> no, we love it. Um, I think now's a great time for me to plug that uh, the library, Dallas at least, is uh, fine free. So. <laughs> yes, I've, I've noticed that that is a thing now. And I'm just like, you know, yeah, uh, you know, a twelve-year-old me really appreciates that now. You know, yeah. yeah so if, if you're a, a a future John Scalzi and you're worried about that thirty-dollar fine, worry no longer. Uh, yeah, <laughs> appreciate it. Um, okay, so uh, John, which of your stories, if you had to pick one, has been mm -hmm. the most enjoyable for you to write, and why? Um. Enjoyable is kind of a weird one because, mm -hmm. you know, 
as you're right, as I'm writing, I don't often really think about the writing process in of itself. You, you get into a flow and it just kind of goes. Um, that said, um, I was talking a little bit about it earlier, but uh, the Kaiju Preservation Society, I think, was the most enjoyable because after a nearly year long struggle to write and uh, for the, all the various reasons and not having it work, I wasn't worried that all of a sudden, you know, the muse had left me and I would never write again. Right. But it was like, what the hell? Right. Like this has not been a thing that I've ever had to contend with before. And to go immediately from that to a story that basically, you know, the expression, it writes itself. Right. Mm. That it really was that like, I can't wait to sit down every day and write this story about big giant monsters and the scientists that study them. Um, that was probably. And so just the experience of that uh, being such a fun book to write in itself, plus coming at the end of just such that long struggle. Um, it's the one that I probably had the most fun with. But the thing is, is that every of my, every of my, all of the novels that I write, there's usually a point at which I'm like, I cannot believe this is actually my job, that I'm mm -hmm. making <laughs> up nonsense, right? Like, mm -hmm. like I, I did literally yesterday, uh, not yesterday, but the day before yesterday, because yesterday I was traveling, but the day before yesterday, I was sitting there typing and I had this scene um, where uh, somebody uh, was trying to give somebody else an invitation to something. Um, and um, the recipient was, was absolutely convinced that, the, uh, that there was something wrong with the invitation. So they made the person who was trying to give the invitation take open up the invitation take the invitation out and lick both sides of it to make sure it wasn't poisoned right <laughs> it's that's the only spoiler i will ever give about this book until it comes out but just mm -hmm. sitting at like having characters like lick that are you kidding me no i'm not kidding you lick that now you know and i'm just like they're paying me for this right <laughs> yeah. right there's at least one or two times in every single uh, novel that I've ever written where I'm just like literally I cannot believe that I get paid for this and I'm sure there are a lot of people like we can't believe you get paid for that either seriously <laughs> but it's too late it's my job now yeah yeah you've got you fooled us this far so <laughs> um I, I can recall a uh, an interview with with Neil Gaiman uh where mm -hmm. he talked about always expecting a man with a clipboard to show up at the house and say it's over Come yeah, on. <laughs> yeah. Back we you, you have it's it's too late for you now. You have to go yeah. back to you know you have to go to back to accountancy. Um, <laughs> it, it's funny for me because I don't ever. Ex I kind of my reaction to that has never been somebody's going to tell me to stop, right? Or it really has been I can't believe I continue to get away with it. It's sort of like the flip side of that. So mm -hmm. it's not sort of it's not the imposter syndrome, but it is the it's like you you're not going to stop me now. How about now? Oh, you're not going to stop me now? How about now? No, I'm going to keep going until somebody finally stops me and nobody's going to stop me because it's novel writing. It's not like, yeah. you know, yeah. it's not arson. So. <laughs> um, so your personal website, whatever, uh, which if, I, I, I'd imagine everyone here has heard of whatever. If you haven't, check it out. It's fantastic. Um, it's been active for quite a while. I think it's, you know, by all metrics, Fairly successful, very successful. Um, sure. Did you, when you were starting out, whatever, did you foresee it becoming successful, as successful as it has? And what advantages do you think it gives you as a creator when it comes to, you know, reaching out to fans and um, right. things like that? Well, obviously, I knew from the moment uh, that it was going to be a phenomenon, right? In 1998, when I started, I was like, clearly, this is going to be the thing that's going to be instrumental in my career. <laughs> I can't believe it took me this long to do this. Um, no, I mean, I, the reason I did it because I used to work in newspapers, I used to have a column and I figured one day I might go back into newspapers, another indication of how wrong my prognosticating skills are. Um, and uh, that being the case, I wanted to keep sharp in the column writing format. So I just wrote every day, you know, it was like something to write every day so that if someone came back and said, we want you to write every day again, only now we'll pay you. Um, that I would be ready. Um, and so that was the only reason I did. It. I had no expectation about how it was going to do or what it was going to do. And there's been an arc to it. You know, it has been there now for, uh, we're coming up on 24 years in September. Um, and it's gone from, you know, it's like, 
you know, blog, what are blogs? Blogs are the hot new thing. Here's like, we've reached peak blog. And now we're at the point where people are like, you're still writing a blog. Are you, you know, are you still listening to prog, you know, per, you know, uh, prog music as well? You know, have you heard of this hot new band called the Beatles? You know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, because now that people have Twitter and Facebook and the TikToks and the Instagrams with the kids, um, having a blog is actually just so, it's almost enduringly old school, right? Mm -hmm. um, but as it turns out, it has been uh, really helpful for the career. I sold Old Man's War because I serialized it on the website and an editor came and said, can I buy that? And I was like, that is cool. That will never happen again. And then it happened again with Agents of the Stars, which I had also put up to, on my website. Um, I've sold a number of books that had been collections of essays that had been published on the blog. Um, I want a Hugo for one of those collections, which is kind of amusing to me. Um, and so, and then, you know, the fact is now, one of the things is that, you know, every couple of days we have a, a writer who has a new book coming in talking about their book in the series that I call The Big Idea. So, it's become this sort of thing that not only is it useful to me, but I try to make it useful to other writers as well. Um, and I had no idea that, you know, 24 years later, I would still be doing this, still having the blog, still, you know, um, having it be an essential thing. But that's sort of the magic of, uh, you know, life. You don't know what things you you don't know what you're doing uh, but more than that you also don't know what things that you are doing that will uh, all of a sudden uh, make things happen and your response to these things as they happen is is really the uh, really important thing I keep doing the blog um, at this point um, mostly uh, partly out of habit but partly because um, you know I write science fiction I don't want most of my science fiction uh, to be uh, a place where, you know, I uh, stand up on a soapbox and lecture people. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I have a blog where that is literally just, you know, let me tell you what I think about this. Right, 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 right. Uh, and that scratches that itch for me. And so my fiction can be my fiction. Having said that, there are a lot of the people I know who are like, oh, but you're terribly didactic. You, you wrote, when you wrote Kaiju, it took place in 2020. And you said mean things about the president then. And I was like, it took place in 2020. You know, the, 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 the group of people who would be uh, in, this, in this book would be the people who would be saying less than kind things about that particular president. So go work with it but generally speaking um you know uh whatever allows me to do a number of things that i don't necessarily want to have happen in my fiction uh my fiction lets me do stuff that you know uh i don't want to have to put on my blog so it all works out very well it's all complementary wonderful um as a as an avid uh, viewer I, I appreciate um you keeping up with it uh, I always oh, yeah. enjoy the uh, <laughs> yeah. Always enjoy the posts. Um, on that topic, um, you are not, you know, you're not shy. Obviously, when it comes to talking about uh, current current trends and topics nope. And, and, nope. and things like that, um, yep. and I, I know you've written about it uh, extensively on your blog. Um, but maybe for those that that haven't read it just yet, what has uh, what has the experience been like for you being a uh, a public figure, an artist that is so vocal about um, things, because not not every artist does so, right? But you, no. but you're able no. to do so. Yeah, not every artist does so, and not every artist should if they is not if that's not something that they feel compelled to do. One of the things uh, that the rise of social media, and I will include blogs in that as sort of proto social media, um, has been to make writers and creators feel like they have to be on all the time and that they have to respond to everything. And, and that is not something that a lot of writers are mentally uh, set up to do. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative or positive way. It's just some people are very private. Some people don't want to talk about their uh, politics, not because they're worried about the backlash, but simply because they're like, these are my politics and I'm going to keep them to myself sort of thing. Um, I think it's very important to acknowledge that writers, creators, humans um, don't have to be public uh, about 
um, every single thing that's happening in the world. It's exhausting. Um, you will get people yelling and screaming at you. It takes a toll. Um, so for those writers and creators who feel like they can't do it because that's not, I mean, because it will have a delete, deleterious effect on them. I understand that I'm a, I'm totally empathetic for it. And I'm like, absolutely don't do it. You mm -hmm. know, find your uh, way to do what you do um, outside of the sphere of writing your fiction uh, and then do it. But for me, <laughs> the thing about it was, and I remind people about this occasionally, um, I was writing about politics as a newspaper columnist long before I was ever a novelist, right? I was a journalist or worked at a newspaper at the very least. You know, I was offering opinions uh, first as a film critic, then as a columnist, then, you know, uh, doing other stuff literally every single day. I am tuned as a writer by training to tell you what I think about things. I used to tell people, or I tell people now, you know, uh, my first job was mansplaining things to people, you know. Um, so as far as it goes, um, I fell backwards into to novel writing. I never expected novel writing to be the thing that I would be known for um, or the thing that, you know, generates, you know, most of my living. Um, and so uh, to think that I would stop doing everything else that I've done literally professionally and personally um, since I could start typing um, is nonsense, right? It's like, I can't, I can't do that. But the other thing about it is that I am not personally constituted to be quiet. I just can't do it. It doesn't mean that people are obliged to listen to me. You know, that's not a thing that, you know, uh, I'm not owned an uh, audience, but uh, absolutely I have opinions and absolutely I'm going to share them. And absolutely some people aren't going to like them. And absolutely I don't give a crap about that, right? It is not, not my role uh, to, uh, to be concerned that not every single person in the world is going to agree or disagree with my politics. Fundamentally, fundamentally, um, it doesn't matter what opinion you have about anything, you're gonna have somebody who's just gonna be like incredibly opposed to it. I have a Pixel phone, right, right? And, and I like my Pixel phone. And now immediately I can tell you that somebody there with an iPhone is like, how dare you? Don't you understand that the iPhone 13 Max is so much better? It's like the camera is better. The whole UI experience is better. You're an idiot for liking pixels at all. You, you know what Google is? Google's trash. Apple's the best, right? It, there's guarantee you there, there's somebody out there that, that's doing that. It doesn't matter what opinion. Pecan pie is my favorite pie. Uh, this, this, you know, strawberry pie erasure sickens me, you know, <laughs> all of this sort of stuff. What about cake? Have you considered cake? Cake is so much better than pie. Um, so literally any, any opinion that you are public about will get somebody uh, worked up about it. I don't want to make an equivalence between, for example, you know, the Pixel phone uh, versus right. iPad, you know, iPhone versus oh, by the way, you shouldn't take away long established rights that, you know, uh, that American citizens have just because you think that that is uh, a thing you should do. These are not equivalent arguments, but the, the amount of feedback you will get for both of them um, is weirdly similar. Um, so if you're going to be a public figure at all, you have to understand that not everybody is going to like you. A lot of people are going to be opposed with what you have to say, regardless of whatever you say. Um, and honestly, if that is a, uh, honestly, if you believe that you should be speaking out about them, then you have to be able, you have to be able to weather that flag. Now that said, um, one of the things that I also do is I'm a big fan of on my blog, I moderate my comments aggressively, right? Mm -hmm. So if people come and they're just jerks, out they go. Um, I mute and block at will all over social media because I think that those people will be happier not seeing me in their feet, <laughs> right? 
but the point about it is, um, you know, I set it, I, you know, uh, I set it up so that, you know, I am able to express opinions and do all this sort of stuff uh, and minimize the nonsense as opposed to constructive dialogue and discussion and all that sort of stuff that can, that can arise, but the utter nonsense just out it goes. And I'm very good at that because I've been doing it for 30 years, you know, um, but not everybody else is. And so again, we come to the thing of understand yourself and your bandwidth and your capability to deal with this stuff and, and then go ahead and proceed from there. But for me, uh, I'm going to do it. And if people are angry about, about the opinions I have, don't buy my books. I don't, you know, I don't need you to buy the books if you if it makes you unhappy every single time you see my name. Don't do that. Hmm. Get me out of your life. There are 300 million people in the United States. If half of them hate me, there's still 150 million people that I can sell to. We will all be fine if you don't read my book. But if you don't really have a strong opinion about me one way or other, please buy my books. <laughs> um. Speaking of strong opinions, uh, yeah. this next this next question I especially like. Uh, if you if your writing style was mm. a band or a genre of music, who or what would, would it be? I I don't know. I've been thinking about <laughs> this for a while. Um, you know, the thing is, is that when I talk about when I talk about my writing, right? Mm. Um, I talk about the fact that I'm a commercial writer, that the sort of my gig uh, and the reason Tor gave me that 13 book deal was that they understand that I am a going to write something that's going to be something that you can basically give to anybody. It's going to be reliably done uh, and that, uh, you know, nine out of 10 times people are going to be like, yeah, I had a good time with that. Some people will be like, this was amazing. Some people are like, why did you give me this trash? But by and large, most people are going to be like, fine with it. So it's not necessarily what genre of music, but I think what I would be, would be, I would be like a reliable songwriter. Like, um, like for example, uh, the Sherman brothers, who wrote all those really popular songs from all the Disney song about all the Disney movies from like 1955 to 1970, like Chim mm -hmm. Chim Cherie, you know, uh, you know, all, all these, all these sorts of songs where people like that's catchy, you know, and some yeah. people are like, Oh God, another Sherman song. What do they have photos of Walt Disney doing strangling kittens? Why do they keep getting hired? <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, or, um, you know, or Carol King, for example, or um, you know the 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 uh, the, the people, uh, the Swedish hit makers, you know, in the current era, who just mm -hmm. you know hit after hit after hit after hit, um, and they are you know and they're popular and they go up the charts and people you know listen to them and for some people they'll be the soundtracks of their lives and for some people they'll be like literally, it's five minutes later and I've forgotten what it. That, song even was right uh, and so i think that is the person i i'm i'm the tin pan alley songwriter who is like you need a hit i'm gonna give you a hit i knock this out here you go it's gonna go right up the charts will you be famous sure for 15 minutes kid enjoy <laughs> it while you have it so that's kind of where i think i am with that. fantastic answer i will definitely be humming chim chim cherry the next time i'm shelving your books right yeah oh yeah exactly <laughs> Skullsy, super califragilistic. <laughs> yes. Put me this in my head. I hate you forever now. Uh, anyway, sorry, I did that to you. I loved it. Um, okay, I, I want to start uh, sprinkling in some, some audience questions. Yeah, absolutely. Now. Let's see. Um, John, have you ever been tempted to cross Skullsy verses a la Asimov? maybe a locked in kaiju so i guess uh, kind of like a robots and robots versus robots versus kaiju i think that's called pacific rim you know <laughs> so i'm not gonna i think that's I, I, that's been essayed you know pretty well for me um i think in the sense of well a lot of what i do I, i'm going to try to answer this and i think the, the, the spirit of the question um a lot of what i do is mashups of of uh, uh, pop culture in the sense of 
taking something that's already well known, the concept of red shirts, kaiju, that sort of thing, and putting a new spin on it. You know, like for with the red shirts, what happens if the red shirts are totally understand that they are in fact red shirts and are trying to find a way out of it. Uh, in the case of the kaiju, what if the kaiju, you know, uh, that our approach with the kaiju was not, uh, they're coming to wreck our cities, but we have to preserve them uh, in their own habitat uh, and help them in, and help them succeed uh, and all that sort of stuff. So always taking an, uh, an angle uh, in terms of, you know, the pop culture stuff that, uh, that, I, that I'm dealing with. Um, so I am always absolutely looking at the things that uh, people already know, that people already love um, and kind of putting a new spin on that. So I don't want to be, you know, the thing is, is that this is both the positive and negative. It makes it easy to uh, write stuff that people immediately get, right? When you talk about, you know, what's the name of the book? Red shirts. Literally every nerd knows what a red shirt is, right? Mm -hmm. Or Kaiju Preservation Society, you know, um, yes. that's not a difficult concept for, for, you know, my readership to grab. Um, so as far as it goes, all of that sort of stuff, um, that's, it's easy to do. But the flip side of it is they're like, Oh, what skulls you're writing? Uh, who's he stealing from today? You know, and it's like, <laughs> and the answer to who am I stealing from today is usually in the text itself, or I will tell you in the acknowledgments because I know that that's part of my gig. Anyway, I think that's the answer that I would give to that question. Yeah. Next question. Let's see. Oh, okay. I think this was in reference to when you you talked about uh, starting and, and stopping writing uh, at the start of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you ever abandoned a novel before, or was that the first time that it happened? It's actually um, the second time. Um, and the first time was, I'd written a book that was called The Android's Dream. Uh, I think it was like the second or third book that I, fourth book that I had written. Um, and it did pretty well. And they were like, hey, if you want to write another one and, that's, uh, and make it a series, do it. Um, and the thing was, so I started writing it. And here's a spoiler, but it's not, you know, but I wrote the book 15 years ago. So if it's a spoiler to you now, I don't know what to tell you. Um, at the end of the book, the protagonist's problems are solved. Uh, his uh, girlfriend is the richest person in the world. And his best friend is a um, artificial intelligence that basically controls an entire planet, right? Um, there are very few scenarios in the world where one or the other couldn't just solve his problems for him, right? Mm. So when I started writing the next book, uh, literally the first seven chapters of it were, um, he can't call his friend, he can't call his girlfriend, right? It's like, he doesn't have access to a cell phone. He has no GPS, you know? Um, and I realized that that's not actually a story, right? That's just a scenario. Um, and I couldn't make the story work. And so I actually had to say to Thor, I was like, I can't write, this book because it's not good. It would be readable, right? Mm. Like you could read it and be like, oh, this, these were words that were in a sequence that I did not hate while I was reading them, but it wouldn't have been a good story and that would have stuck with me. I mean, every time I write a book, I try to write as good a book as I can at the time, given my talents. Um, and that would have been a book that I knew was not up to my level of, you know, like I felt like I gave it the right amount. So when I got a bad review, as I inevitably would, um, most of the time when I get bad reviews, I'm like, eh, you know, cause I did what I could. But this one, the bad reviews would stick with me because I would know that they were right. Like, like you know, this is him half-assing it. It's like, ah, they, they, they knew. Um, so I abandoned that book and I wrote uh, Zoe's Tale instead. And Zoe's Tale got nominated for a Hugo. So well done me. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. I've always wondered about that uh, because you're right. Sometimes I'll, I'll read a story or see a movie and everything works out just so well at the end. The, the villain is vanquished and everything is fantastic. And then you hear the sequels coming and I'm wondering why, well, how are they? <laughs> yeah. and, and the answer is always the same money, right? Yeah. You know, um, the, uh, there's always something, you know, there's always a price and people like, like, for example, red shirts, people are like, mm -hmm. would you ever do a sequel to red shirts? I was like, Thematically and textually, there's no reason to mm -hmm. write a sequel to Red Shirts. If Tor came and backed <laughs> up a money truck, I mean, literally an entire dumpster 
full of dollar, you know, full of bills, then I would write it, you know, and I would be honest about it. Why'd you write it? I wrote it for the money, you know, <laughs> but I would still try to write a good novel. Um, but there's no reason for that. It would literally be, why did you write it? I wrote it for money. Why is there a sequel to this movie? Because that movie made a billion dollars and they're not going to leave the next $600 million out there not to be taken. It's a business. Yeah. <laughs> People need to make money. I need to eat. My cats, the cats like food. I like the, uh, I like the visual of the, uh, the, uh, the dumpster of money on your lawn and you saying, all right. <laughs> Fine. Fine. Here's a, we live in a capitalist society. You have pressed the capitalist trigger. I will give you the capitalist goods. Um, which is the thing that always gets me when every once in a while someone calls me a socialist. I was like, have you, have you ever heard me talk about money? That's, yeah. it does not track. Anyway, go ahead. Um, okay, this was a prepared question from our calendar that somebody submitted. Uh, what was uh, your inspiration for when you um, started Old Man's War? Money, no. Um, <laughs> it all comes around. I, I mean, well, I, in all honesty, uh, in all honesty, when I started writing, or I wanted to write, uh, a, when I started writing Old Man's War, I was, I'd written Agent to the Stars to basically find out whether or not I could write novels. And the answer seemed to be yes. Um, so I was like, okay, the next book I actually want to write to sell, like uh, to actually get published and to do all that sort of stuff. Um, and so I went into a bookstore um, to see basically what kind of science fiction was selling. Uh, and it seemed to be military science fiction because there were a lot of military science fiction books at the time. Um, and I was like, okay, well, I guess maybe I'll try writing a military science fiction book. So it was entirely cynical of this seems to be selling, maybe I'll write that. Now, having said that, and this is actually an extremely important point, um, having decided that that was going to be the thing that I was gonna try writing, um, I were, wrote a, science, a military science fiction novel that I wanted to read that would interest me that would have a story that I thought wasn't necessarily being told in a way that, you know, uh, that I could tell it. Um, and that became Old Man's War. So the impetus of it was, gee, it'd be nice to sell a book. Um, but the execution of it was, I want, to re I want to write a book that I would really want to read. And so you can have both of those uh, uh, things work uh, in tandem with each other. Um, so I know we're coming to the uh, the end of the hour here, so just try to fit in yeah. a few more. Well, we started um, we started a couple minutes late, so if you want to go over just a couple of minutes, we can do that. That's true. Um, well, this is one one of mine uh, because I know you uh, you if you don't follow John on, on any medias or check out the blog, uh, he has a, a tendency to eat interesting burritos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so one of the thank you for I that very kind <laughs> euphemism. Yeah, one of the questions um, I had was, have you ever regretted any of said burritos? Has there ever been one that where you were just like, this, this was a bad choice? So uh, a number, a couple of years ago, um, when I hit uh, like 100, either 140 or 160,000 Twitter followers, I was like, and now I'm going to celebrate by making a burrito. And it was Valent, and I think it was Val near Valentine's Day. So I made a burrito that was... Um, Little Debbie heart-shaped snack cakes, chocolate cordials, marshmallow fluff, uh, gummy worms. Um, there was something else that was in it as well. Um, and I just put them in, and then I pan fried it in butter, you know, cinnamon sugar and stuff like that. And of course I ate, I, because, because if I don't actually like document it, people will think I just did stunt burritos. Sure. Like, you know, you mm -hmm. said that you made this and yet, right? <laughs> Um, so after having put all that stuff in there, um, I did a video of me eating this thing. Um, and, uh, I got a couple of, and, and after it stopped, I like had another bite and I was like, I can't because one, my <laughs> blood sugar just <laughs> exploded. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I literally felt like, you know, uh, like there was just like my body had become mostly glucose and it just needed to stop. And so I, I was like, this was not a good idea. I can't finish this, you know? And I, so I didn't even get eat half of it. I just like took the two or three bites 
needed for the video. Now, the funny thing about this is a year later, I was on the cruise. It's called the Joko Cruise, which is a nerd cruise. Um, and one of the things that they did was they did uh, desserts and other dishes that they named after performers that were on the cruise. And so they did the John Scalzi Valentine burrito, the ball oh, ballerino no. or something <laughs> like that. And so they took all the ingredients that I had given them that I had enlisted, except for the gummy worms, the gummy worms just weren't gonna work. Um, and they made dessert burritos out of them. And so I had to order one, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I tried it and I was expecting it to be as horrible as mine was. And it was amazing. Wow. And I was, <laughs> and I was, and, and scales fell from my eyes. It was like, this is the difference between <laughs> a jerk doing things for the internet uh, and actual people who know what they're doing working with, you know, it's like, well, these are the ingredients that we have. How do we make this actually a pleasurable experience? One, it was much smaller. But the second thing was also all the proportions were better. It was just extraordinarily well done. And, and I was so angry that they took something that I was like, I can't finish this and made it something that was like, I wish I had seconds. I love that um, people might suspect you of secretly like like there's going to be this expose that somebody sees a chipotle wrapper in the background that you you swap yeah. the burritos off camera they're stunt burritos he's <laughs> stunning he's fixed it in post well no and that's the thing is is like you know fundamentally the thing about these burritos uh and is that they they basically are here are leftovers they're about to mm. go bad you need to eat them put them in a tortilla because then you can like eat and type at the same time right because i'm you know I'm eating at my desk because I'm a, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a pathetic writer nerd who never leaves his, never leaves his desk. So that's why I started doing them. And I, you know, and every once in a while you would have, you know, when I started, it was just like, I have chow mein and I have <laughs> this other thing that doesn't go with chow mein, but why not? And I was like, look at this. I did a silly burrito. And the response, people were just like, how, how do you, how have you not been dragged for crime? I was like, well, <laughs> if that's the way you're going to be about it, then I'm going to do it more. So, um, so eventually they became, it became a, a bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also, I grew up poor, you don't waste food. So, you know, fundamentally, I, if I made it, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm gonna eat it. I'm gonna eat that thing. Um, now, the, the thing that I think is the saving grace with the burritos, honestly, is I do them to myself. <laughs> I'm not like, I'm not like serving them to other people. I'm not like, you know, I've put chicken and chocolate sauce and gherkins and whipped cream all in mm -hmm. a burrito and I'm serving it to you. And then people would be like, no, thank you, right? I'm not doing it to anybody else. It's only self-abuse. So, you know, even, you know, it, it, Chrissy's like, you know, my wife, she'd be like, what are you doing? What are the ingredients? <laughs> I'm like, you want some? She's like, really? No, thank you. So not even, <laughs> not even the, I don't even serve them to the dog. So it's, it's all on me. We appreciate you taking taking, uh, taking a few, for, few burritos for the team. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, oh, okay, so we have uh, somebody in person uh, upstairs from where I am watching that has submitted a question, says they're a big fan, ha having a great time. And okay, they're wondering um, what paper you used to write for and what was your what was your column or your section? Oh, um, so um, this was a job that I got straight out of college. Um, I worked for the Fresno Bee newspaper in Fresno, California. Uh, and uh, I had two jobs there. I had the, first I was the film critic. And so that was my main job, right? And, um, uh, and I did that for, from 1991 to 1996. Around 1993, I got a job offer, um, not a job offer, I was up for a job um, at the St. Paul Pioneer Press. And it was down to me and one other guy. And um, the other guy got the job, uh, but, my, but my editor didn't know that at the time. So I walked into my editor's office and they knew that I was looking at this other job. And I was like, if you give me a 30% raise and a newspaper and a weekly column, I'll stay. And they were like, okay. Cause they were paying me nothing anyway. The 30% raise would be like, congratulations. You can get the fancy mac and cheese. Um, <laughs> 
And then they gave me, and then they gave me the column, um, which was great that they said yes, because if they said no, then I would have been out of a job and I would have no job prospects. Uh, and I would be working at McDonald's, which is a noble profession, but not one that I wanted. Um, so uh, that's how I started writing uh, the column. And so once a week I would write about, sometimes it would be funny stuff, sometimes it would be political stuff, sometimes it would be funny political stuff. I had actually one of the first viral emails on the <clears throat> internet um, when, uh, what was his name? Newt Gingrich was teaching a, a class and he was talking about the biological differences between men and women. And one of the things he said is like, men are genetically engineered to go out and hunt giraffes. And I'm like, why giraffes? Why, why not giraffes? You know, so I did this poll. It's like, you know, men, have you ever felt the urge to hunt a giraffe? You know, uh, yes. do you think a giraffe would taste like chicken? all of these sorts of stuff. And so it went into the newspaper column, which is why I did it. But then I emailed it to some friends and then it went literally everywhere. And I was getting like 300 email responses a day for it. Uh, and ultimately um, I got a job at America Online as their writer and editor because somebody there had uh, read that. So wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the, you never know what the internet's gonna yeah. give you. Um, but before we wrap up, I do want to know what did what did the what did the data say? Do men predominantly want to go hunt some giraffe, or was the data inconclusive? No, most men were like, "Why? Why? Why would I hunt a giraffe?" <laughs> Boy, they didn't, you know, it's like they don't they don't even they, they can't even scream, you know. It's, it's, you, know it's, you know, if you stab them, um, so no, most men absolutely did not want to hunt giraffes. They're like, "I don't need to hunt a giraffe. We have we have Vaughns, right? Yes. We can just go there instead." <laughs> that's good to hear. <laughs> um, well, uh, we don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you're at vacation and uh, either right. to uh, step away from the orange background. Great, right, exactly. Um, before we say goodbye, are there any um, upcoming projects or anything we should look out for from you? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I'm currently writing another novel. Um, hopefully that will come out next year. Um, I'm now late on that novel because um, I did actually verifiably just have COVID um, and it did scramble my brain for a while. So uh, I'm about a month behind on that, but hopefully it'll come out next year. Um, maybe it was supposed to come out maybe like May, June. It might come out like August, September, depending on what, we, what we're doing with it. Um, I will be having actually something that's going to come out in September that hasn't officially been announced yet. Um, so I can't tell you what it is yet. But it is coming in September, and it will make a lot of people happy uh, because it's uh, related to something that I've already done before. Um, so that's coming this year. Next year, another novel. Um, and then beyond that, uh, more novels and more whatever, and uh, hopefully more stuff that uh, people will like to read. And uh, I'll be doing that for as long as I can, as they still let me get away with it. People are like, you're not going to quit writing, are you? I was like, literally, what else am I going to do with my life? I am <laughs> yeah. 53 years old now. It's too late for, you know, a second profession. I'm not going to all of a sudden go off and become a lawyer. I promise. <laughs> well, we, we appreciate it. And I, I know I, I probably speak for everyone else here when I say, you know, thank you for continuing to, to write and entertain. And uh, I'm excited to see what else you, uh, you get away with. <laughs> thank you thank you so much um but yeah thank you everyone who tuned in um whether you're upstairs online watching this as a recording sometime in the future thank you so much for joining us and thank you so so much john for taking the time to uh grace us with with your presence today. oh you're welcome i had a wonderful time and now i'm going to the pool so <laughs> bye everybody take, take care <laughs>